please take your copy of God's Word and join me in the book of Revelation. If you'd find chapter 3, verse 7, that's where we begin this morning as we're continuing uh, through each of these seven letters to the churches that are mentioned in Revelation. Uh, we are now at the sixth one, so just one more. Uh, we all have passwords that we have to deal with in our day. We just kind of live in that world where you just got to you know, have passwords to get into everything, right? You got a password to get into your phone. Sometimes you just use your face, right? Isn't that crazy? Emails, computers, bank account, you know, just you get online and man, you just passwords. Anybody ever have to hit that forgot password button? What would we do without that button? Right? I mean, I, you know, use it all the time. Uh, it's a frustrating feeling if you've ever experienced it and you likely have where you just locked out of something you can't get in you're delayed uh you feel that sense of disappointment and you're just there's some barrier blocking you and uh if you've ever been locked out of your house or your car uh you know what kind of panic that feels like don't you and it's very frustrating but the moment someone shows up with a key the moment someone shows up and lets you in your heart starts beating normal again and you feel this great sigh of relief that uh, that barrier has been removed. Everything's right in your world again. Well, the title of our message this morning speaks to this. It's called The Open Door. The Open Door. This church here, the church in Philadelphia, uh, is going to get a br fresh breath of air, a sigh of relief. You'll see why here in just a few moments. And just consider uh, what might be in front of you that either might be closed or open. Find Revelation 3 verse 7 if you haven't already. Let's dive in this morning. It says this, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. An open door just right before them, and there's one before us today. I'd have you first just consider an access that is authorized. You find that in, in verse 7. There's this access that is being described. And as what Jesus has done in his other letters and what he is doing with these churches is he reveals something about his person, something about himself that is directly related and linked to the message that he has for that church. Right? So that church there in Smyrna that needed some, you know, to overcome some battles, he identifies himself the one who was dead but is now alive. So that's directly linked to the message he has for this for that church and so the church in Philadelphia they get a glimpse into Jesus Christ his nature and uh, which has everything to do with the message that's before them and and what's before us and so a unique description uh, is given of you says he who is holy he who is true and he who has the key of David and he who opens and so let's just kind of break this down somewhat briefly uh, he who is holy uh, if you're not sure exactly what that word means, it means distinct, unlike any other. And he is unlike any other in many different ways. I mean, he is holy in every possible way. Uh, he is perfect. He's the sinless son of God without sin. Uh, he is uh, pure in, in its purest form. Uh, no deceit within him, no, no sin. And he is unique in the fact that he is all God and all man. And so we, he is unique in that way. We have one mediator between God uh, and man and the man Christ Jesus. And so uh, he fits this unique description, this distinction. He is holy. In fact, so holy, the angels cry out before him, holy, holy, holy. Uh, because that's who Jesus Christ is. His name is holy. And we must honor and reference his name as holy. His presence makes any location holy once he shows up. Uh, oftentimes in scripture they're told to take your sandals off. Uh, show some reverence because you're standing on holy ground because of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, there. He is holy. And it says he is true. That means to be real, genuine is the definitions of that word. He's true in every single possible way. He is genuine. He is full of grace and 
truth. Uh, he is trustworthy. He is real. There's no deceit. Uh, he's our one true God. He is true light. He is true bread. His word is true because he is true. It's, he's the source uh, of of his word and so his word is true and trustworthy because that's who his nature is that's the person of Jesus Christ and uh, words that describe him especially in the book of Revelation he's gonna come and it's gonna be a name on him written on his thigh it says faithful and true because he's true and he must be worshiped in spirit and in truth that's who Jesus Christ is holy and true I want to hone in on a description here it says he who has the key of David he who has the key of David. So this is, it speaks to his person now. Is, this is what's in his possession. And uh, this key. And what in the world does this key have to mean for us, for that church? Well, it's talking about he's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. God made a covenant to David and says there will be one that will come from you that will sit on your throne, that will come from your line, and he'll sit on there forever. Uh, 2 Samuel 7 verse 16 says this, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever and Jesus Christ shows up fulfilling this Davidic covenant and he says I have that key so he's holy he's true and he has the key that and the only one and the only key that can open up this door and everybody needs this door open that's not a door just for the Jewish people uh, or you know Old Testament Saints I mean whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile the door is closed for you for your eternal salvation to, to receive uh, forgiveness of your sins, uh, to be in this kingdom of the son of his love. Uh, there is only one way you get in, Jew, Gentile, everyone for the whole earth needs this key. And Jesus Christ, he has the key. He has the key. Uh, keys represent authority, by the way, too. If you don't have keys, you don't have uh, authority. And in scripture, it's, it's certainly representative of that. Uh, Jesus Christ has all authority over his kingdom, so much so, Matthew 28, there in the Great Commission, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given unto me. He has the keys of death and Hades. He has the key of David unlocking the door of eternal life. And so uh, he has that key, and there's no access apart from him. So we got this unique description of the Lord Jesus uh, consider an unmovable door that's mentioned in this text. He says this, he has the key of David and he opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And so what Jesus Christ does with this door, uh, there, whatever, whichever opens or shut, there's nothing you and I can do or say about it any other way. And I believe this speaks to, I'm going to speak of two doors. Uh, I'll speak to one in a minute, but this being the door of salvation, I think is very clearly evident in this text the door of eternal life did you know is unmovable that is an unmovable door whether it's open or whether it's shut uh, and it speaks to the access John 10 verses 9 through 10 Jesus says this I am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture the thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy I have come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And the only way you find life, life eternal, life abundant on this side, on the other side of heaven, is if you have walked through the door, Jesus Christ, using that as a metaphor, I am the door, he has the key that unlocks it for you. And look, when he opens it up, there is no one, there's no force in this universe that can ever shut it. Isn't that good? Because he has the authority to do it. And as you walk through that open door of salvation, Man, no one, not even Satan himself, can do anything about that. But let me say this. That door is open today. It is very open. But there's going to come a time when that door will shut. And every opportunity will be removed. And when Jesus Christ shuts that door, that's it. No one, no one, I don't care how strong they are, how powerful they are, no one can help you in opening that door once it is closed. Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, spoke of parables about this. Uh, on the hills of the one where he mentions Noah's Ark, right? That door was shut. And in that day, when that door was shut, in that judgment period, Noah and his family was on the inside. And once that door was shut, there was no one coming in. While it was open, it was all good. But once it was shut, that's it. There's a parable Jesus uh, describes. And I'm going to 
just read it for you. It's found in Luke 13, verse 23. It says, One said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? I mean, what a great question to ask Jesus Christ when you're asking about salvation. Does, is it few? Jesus says this, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. That's a heartfelt plea right there. Please open. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now, when that door is open, it's all well and good to come in. But once it's shut, there will be the greatest panic you've ever felt. It'll be far worse than ever being locked out of your house, locked out of your car, the inconvenience of trying to track down a key, a locksmith or something. This door, once it is shut, that is it. And it's shut for all of eternity. And that is a panic panic situation. In fact, it, it really drew up a memory, a kind of a bad memory that I have. Uh, when we were living in downtown Dallas, we lived on Dallas Theological Seminary's campus. And it's like an apartment building that's, you know, a somewhat short sky rise or whatever, but it's built like a hotel. Meaning if you don't have keys, like these key fobs, you can't get in. You can't even get into the gate. You can't even get into the door. But, and then once you're in, man, you can just move. There's an elevator that'll take you to your rooms, but you access your rooms on the inside. So we were living there on the third, third floor, and uh, our son, slip, he had a sleepwalking problem. I think he still does a little bit, but uh, he was about six or seven at the time. And he had woken up uh, asleep and thought he was going into our bedroom and had just ran outside. Well, I always had them take their shoes off, and so they put their shoes by the door, and so and getting the door open, and when it shut, it shut on the shoes, and so it just left the door open, and so it also kind of minimized the sound of all that, and then he begins to just, in his mind, you're, it's crazy, when you sleepwalk, you can still like do stuff, and your subconscious is just kicked in and going, but you're just sleeping, uh, kind of like the church that we looked at last week. And he just kind of goes and goes and goes down the hallway and just his, that subconscious takes over. He knows how to get on the elevator, goes down, and works himself outside. Got outside. You know what the problem is? He didn't have a key. And so then he couldn't get out, couldn't come back in. And, and just to tell you, if, uh, parents, you know that what, that would, what you would feel like if your kid was out there a few hours, which he was. And, uh, you know... Thank God for grace and mercy for parents, right? You know, uh, but you feel like you're the worst in the world when stuff like that happens. Well, he had somehow got back in, comes to me, wakes me up, and he's, and he's telling me about this. And I'm like, he just had a bad dream. Well, come to find out, no, it really did happen, and they had it on camera. But there was a guy that had just come home from work that, that lived in that apartment who was working a night shift, found him outside, opened the door, and let him in. And so he got a sense of that panic. But you know what? I'm so glad, so thankful that someone had authority, had a key in the possession, and just opened the door and let him come safely in. Do you know Jesus Christ is in that business, and that's what he has the key. And I'm so thankful that he's not in the business of trying to close doors. He is in the business to open them up. And right now, I believe the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to some of you and he's speaking and saying, you have not walked through this door yet. And if you haven't, I'm just here to tell you, it is open. And he wants to let you in. It is open and is open. But one day, that door will shut. And once it shuts, that's it. There is no opening it back up. It's appointed for man to die once. And after this, the judgment, the Bible says, that's it. You have an opportunity. And the Bible screams it over and over again in a repetitive fashion. Now is the day of salvation. The time is now. Each and every day that passes, we get closer to the Lord's return. We get closer to him setting up his kingdom that we're all waiting for. But that door will shut for many, many people. And so thank God that Jesus has this access that is authorized. Let me just give you some assignments that are appointed. 
And these speak of assignments that are today, and doors still open up for day for God's people today. Uh, look with me in verse 8. He says, I know your works. See, have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And I'm just going to work down through the, these next through few verses, and I'm just going to hit some heavy application here that, that I believe describes, and you can apply this open door. And so just consider that. Uh, this open door uh, as it just is laid out before us. In fact, let me just give you some principles you may have it there on your outline. That very first one is the placement. The placement. Consider the placement of this open door. He says, see, I've set before you an open door. An open door of ministry, it is so good. It just is placed before you. Uh, it's something for our day in the present. He's still in the business while we're alive, while we're here serving him. He puts an open door of ministry before you, which implies for this church and for us today, if that happens, God has more in store for you to do. That would have been a good word for this church, that he's not closing our door. He set a door of ministry that is open before you. And I'm thankful we're not through yet because when COVID hit, for many, some doors were shut on ministry. Uh, there were churches that did not recover and closed their doors. And, you know, we had kind of had some prayer services and meetings around that because we weren't sure what God was doing here. And aren't you glad that you can look back through COVID and say, God did not shut a door. In fact, in COVID, he opened the door. The fact that we had a service met that before us and we have a service next to us shows that God has opened the door for us. Aren't you glad God has more for Robin Wood Baptist Church to do? It's an open door for ministry. And so this placement, and it was just placed before us. We didn't go out having to search it and look for it. Man, it just, we were asking what he wants us to do, and he says, I have it right here. And he opened it up for us. Uh, you don't have to look. As you walk in God's will, you can't miss them. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to counsel a young man that's in ministry, trying to figure out uh, his calling and all that. And over and over again, he's, he's kind of reached out. It's like, I need to meet with you. And my counsel to him would be the same counsel I'm about to give you right now. I would count, give it to anybody. And that counsel is this. As you walk in the things that you know God wants you to do, the, the, those doors that are just already open, uh, to be at church on Sunday morning, that, that is something that you don't really have to pray about. God, do you want me to go to church on Sunday? Aren't you thankful for some easy decisions? That, that is an easy decision. That's something you can do for your life that you know is in the center of God's will. You can give, give a tithe. That is something that you know that God wants you to do. You can serve in church, finding a place. And then as you're just doing these things, as you're praying, as you're following him, man, this, this door just opens up and it becomes this specific Man, assignment that God has for your life. And it fits with the way he created you, with the way he gifted you. And it's something that will advance his kingdom and build up and edify the local church. And so if you don't know what that specific door is, then you just continue to walk through the doors that you know are open for you to do right now. Because when he puts it before you, that placement is in such a way you can't miss it. It's just right there. It's obvious. And really what's next is you need to just walk through it. And that's, you still have a responsibility to walk through that open door. But he leaves the responsibility. He opens the door for you. It's just already open. Consider the preparation. Uh, once it's open, it's already open. No one can shut it. And you just walk through it. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I've found that God prepares you uh, as well as he does the door of ministry he places before you. And so he prepares you as he's actually preparing this door. So the things that you're doing right now as you're faithful, man, there's a door that's being prepared. And when it's set before you, it's just swung wide open. And as you trust him and as you walk in faith and you walk through that door, you'll find that door of ministry, man, was prepared for you while you were back here, while you were doing things before that door was ever set before you. I still kind of chuckle to this day because some of my professors, they knew what I was doing here, you know, several years ago when I was, uh, doing, especially doing my undergrad. One of them introduces me and he keeps saying this. He's like, he's the financial guy who he says, I, he'll be like, oh, he's got a financial background. And I, I've told him over and over again that I don't. <laughs> and I've like gone to him, I'm like, look, I, I, I'm really not. But here's the story. 
Uh, before I ever became pastor, I was the financial administrator here at Robin Wood Baptist Church. That door swung open, and the, it, maybe some of you are here. You voted on that, that that could happen, and so this is all your fault, okay, that I'm even your pastor today. So that door, it swung open. I said, look, to the pastor at that time, I don't, I've never done this before, but sure, I guess I, I could definitely use a little bit of more income if, to make this sacrifice, but I'm willing to do it. And I had no clue at that time of the preparation that was happening for me. I still look at it to this day. I still chuckle when, the, when that one professor now introduces me to a group of people that I don't know. He's like, oh, yeah, he's a financial guy. I'm like, I am not. I'm not. I learned what to do here. But I thank God when that door of being a pastor opened up for me that I had all that preparation coming into it. And I'm telling you, the same thing happens for you. These doors are placed before you. You can't miss them. And as you walk through them, I say, you've been prepared as that door prepared for you. Uh, what trips me out even more is I lived a long time as a lost person. 27 years and the fact that any of this would have been even prepared for me but even then I just I can't wrap my brain around that that God's grace and his mercy uh, that he prepares stuff even beforehand that we might walk in it each time you walk through the door let me tell you this you trust God with every step he opens it our job is not to get afraid our job is not to run our job is not to just go you know I don't know you know, I'm not sure. Look, when it's open, you just walk through it. And each step, he'll prove himself faithful and faithful and faithful. But you must walk through the open door. Let me speak to the provision. God provides everything you need for it. Notice he says, you have a little strength. Have kept my word, have not denied my name. You know, all you need, if, that is, if that's all you got is a little strength, uh, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we'll look at our own resources and we'll say, you know what, I just don't have the resources to do this, to do what God's asking me to do. Look, their strength was what wasn't keeping them going anyway. Their strength might have been little and small. Maybe this church was on its last leg and, you know, maybe they're, they're just doing everything they can to be faithful. You know, they're just, just doing whatever they can. But the fact that they were still running had nothing to do with their strength. You know who his strength it had to do with? The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is holy, the one who is true, the one who is faithful. That's the strength that we trust in as well. Paul said this in Philippians 4.13. You know this. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It doesn't matter what the situation is, whether I'm in poverty, whether I, it's, you know, I have more than enough. If he's asking me to do something I'm not sure about, look, and I, maybe I don't have resources. If you just walk through that open door, he provides everything. The provision is always there. He assumes full responsibility of your needs. He obligates himself to provide when you obey. That's the way it works. You obey and all that provision comes right here. We didn't have the money to do all the stuff we're doing right, right now. But we're not relying on our resources. We're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He who is holy. He who is true. Some turn their back on open doors because they think, I just you know, can't do that. Where's the money going to come from? Where is this going to come from? And all these excuses, you know where they're looking? They're looking inward. They're looking, I don't have all these resources, instead of looking to the one who's got everything you need, to the one who actually opened the door for you. You will walk through it. Won't you trust him? Man, you take it to the bank, put your life, eternal life on it. I'm telling you, he is faithful. He is true every single time. Dare we not turn a back to an open door because of the lack of resources. Who are you trusting in? It's a question you must answer. Now we've got the petitioners. I think this is kind of a fun little group to settle down on. Verse 9 says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Here's what's kind of going on in this text right here. He's already said you got a little strength, right? You have not denied my name. You've been obeying me. And in the presence of their ministry and what they're doing, there's a little group down the street, synagogue of the Jews, uh, who are their, just, you know, the thorns in their side. And uh, a group that is saying that they're Jews, that they're the real thing. They're saying all of these things. Um, but Jesus identifies them as a synagogue of Satan. 
Uh, and you'll see when someone is affected, when someone is walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, man, there comes a thorn from somewhere. Uh, and you can trace it back to Satan himself in some way. And so it just seems to happen uh, like this. But he says, I'm going to make them come and worship before your feet. Well, Jesus is obviously not condoning us to be worshipped, right? But the, the, the word for worship means just prostrating yourself, bowing the knee. And maybe some of your translations say that. Uh, in this context, it's like this uh, a plea for, for, for help or some kind of recognition of respect. And it made me think of Joseph and his brothers. Remember how Joseph was treated in the Old Testament, right? He got that fancy coat of many colors. His brothers didn't appreciate that. They cast him into a well, tried to get rid of him. But it was the very people that did all that to Joseph that one day the tables turned. They come back around and their situation is so bad, they're bound and knee before Joseph because they need some help. And isn't it good to know as you walk through open doors of ministry that are before you, even though they may not be very popular to others, and it's going to rub people the wrong way, as you obey Jesus Christ in front of those people that are, you know, the antagonists, those who oppose you, and all of those things, it could be. Even that person you might be afraid of, I can't obey and do this because of this person. What is going to happen? It could be that very person that gets in such bad shape one day, they're coming and recognizing that Jesus loves you and hey, could you pray for me? I actually need some help now. They just turn into the petitioners. You be faithful, and what is happening right now isn't indicative of what might be happening or will happen in the future. There's going to be naysayers. Did you know that when you walk through an open door? You're going to have adversaries. You're going to have people that don't like that. Can you believe that we tore down a building and there was people that didn't like that? I mean, oh, there's a, we started a Spanish church, and there were people that really weren't on board with that. You're going to have antagonizers, but Jesus Christ is fully capable of dealing with all of them. I find it very comforting that I don't have to go defend myself. I don't have to say, you know what? Jesus does love me, sucker, and I'm actually obeying him. I don't have to do any of those things, and neither do you. Because Jesus Christ, all he's called you and I to do, walk through the open door, and he is fully capable of fighting every battle that comes your way. He is fully capable of defending yourself. He can go to work for you, to fight for you, do all of these things. He says, I'm going to make them, and I'm gonna, they're going to recognize it in such a way that you're my people. They're going to come, likely, even you're going to have to help them in some way. You might be the very blessing to the enemy that's before you right now. Just walk through the open door. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7 through 9, you'll see this principle. Paul says this, for I do, to the church in Corinth, I do not wish, you, wish to see you now on the way. I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul says, look, I want to come to you, but I got delayed. Man, God set this open door in front of me, and look, I'm going to walk through it. I, I, I thought I was going to you know, be there a little bit sooner, but I'm going to walk through this open door, and he acknowledges what's also there, many adversaries. There's going to be adversaries. But you walk through those open doors anyway because that's where God's effective power for ministry is. That's where his blessing is. That's where his provision is. That's where the center of his will for your life is. Any other door, any other pathway, anything else, I'm telling you, you don't have any of that. And it's a miserable feeling, even when the adversaries are there. Let me speak to the protection. We're going to just keep working our way down through this. If you'll look in verse 10, he says, Because you have kept my word, my command to persevere... I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So this is speaking of a specific period. No Christian is ever uh, kept or withheld from testing. No Christian is ever withheld from the testing, the growing of your faith, persecution, or even tribulation. But notice he says something specific, the hour of temptation, the hour of test. This is a specific period, and, you, and it, it's a, a glimpse into what's going to come after chapter 4 in the tribulation period. And he says, I'm going to keep you from that. And the reason is, is because that is God's judgment on the earth. And that is still opportunities for people to walk through the open door of salvation, even though they're going to continue to reject and reject. But that has nothing to do with the church. And so you are withheld from this, he says. I'm going to protect you as it happens on the whole world, as this happens and it touches every place on earth. Guess what? If you walk through the open door of salvation, 
you protected from that. Isn't that a good feeling? There, he is uh, going to protect you. He's going to keep you from that specific hour. And guess what? It is coming. And if you haven't walked through that door yet, I'm just going to tell you, this is a, that's a period of testing that you don't want. You just keep reading the book of Revelation, you'll see why. Uh, those who walk through the door, though, they're protected from this judgment and the eternal judgment to come. Let me speak to the perseverance. Verse 11 says this, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So, I'm coming quickly. It means it's imminent. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And he says, you hold fast what you have. You don't give up. You persevere. And then there's this caution. It was kind of, it's all green lights for this church, right? All open doors, and this, you get a little yellow here. And it's a little caution. And it should be a caution for you and for me as well. Hold fast that you have. Why? What's the purpose of that? That no one may take your crown. The temptation sometimes is this, uh, is to quit. And sometimes you'll be doing stuff, and you'll be doing stuff for the Lord, and you really can't see no visible fruit. And there's a temptation that says, God's not working. God's not doing anything. And a temptation is to throw in the towel to quit, even in the midst of an open door. And you know you're walking an open door right now. He's put before you. And still there's this temptation to not hold fast. But here's the deal. We need to recognize something. God is going to get his agenda done. And he will do that either with or without you. He can do it. And he will do it. And so if someone says, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore, it doesn't like somehow throw off God's plans, like he's not sovereign or not powerful enough to figure it out and to make it and press it all the way through. When someone seems to throw in their towel, they don't hold fast, he will find somebody that will come in and step into that assignment and they will get the job done. And as they do it, you forfeit the crown and then they get the crown. This crown is victor's crown, a symbol of a reward, especially in the Greek games at this time. I mean, it's something for someone who had achieved something and uh, had won the victory. And so there are examples in Scripture where someone has forfeited their crown. There's no greater, I think, example than Saul and David. Saul had the crown, the king, he's the king of Israel. That was his assignment. And yet he got to the point to where he would not do everything God wanted him to do. But then he found someone who would, a man named David. In fact, David came in and he took Saul's crown. In fact, he, he almost got his armor. If you look at David and Goliath, that story, Saul took off his armor and tried to put it on David. Already a glimpse of, of this transition that is going to be taking place. In fact, David says, I don't need that armor. <laughs> I'm going to trust in the Lord. And just over and over again proves that he is God's man. He is the man for his job because he is not going to stop short like Saul. He's not going to do part of it or get most of it done. He's going to come in and do the whole thing. And, man, Saul gave up his crown to David. There's one more example that I want to look at. I'll invite you, if you will, turn your, in your Bibles, and we're going to close down after I make some applications from this text. But uh, please turn to Isaiah chapter 22. And I ask that you would turn to verse 15 of Isaiah 22. This is probably one of the closest texts, actually, out of all Scripture to what Jesus Christ has already said. He actually quoted, you may not have realized it, you will in a second, he actually quoted from this text to that church when he says, I have the key, I open the door, no one shuts it, I... Uh, close the door that no one opens. It actually comes from here, and I just want to walk you through a guy who really gave up his crown. He's a man named Shebna, and uh, Eliakim comes in, and he takes over the crown. Consider just some principles, and I'll, I'll keep it brief, okay? Based on your response, I think I can get you out for the Cowboy game today, okay? It's at three o'clock, so I'm going to base this off your response. Y'all going to hang with me? Let's just work through this text just briefly, Verse 15 says this, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Go proceed to this steward, to Shebna, who is over the house. He has an assignment. And this is what you need to say to him. What have you here? And whom have you here that you have honed out a sepulcher here? As he who hones out a sepulcher on high, who carves a tomb for himself in a rock. 
Indeed, the Lord will throw you away violently, O mighty man, and will surely seize you. Well, what has happened so far? This guy has an assignment, but somewhere along the assignment, you know what he started wanting to do? Make himself known. And he starts honing out a tomb, a sepulcher, this, a grave, a place to be buried. And you're like, what is he doing? It seems like this guy, in the, while he's doing something for the Lord, he's a steward, has this assignment, he gets off track, and then he starts going, I'm going to make sure people are going to remember me after I die. And he starts setting up something for his own name, a memorial to Shebna. And as he's doing this, right, his face is there and his back is to the door that has been opened for him. And God says this, verse 17, the Lord will throw you away violently, O mighty man, and will surely seize you. He will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. My goodness. Now, Tom Brady can throw a good ball. I don't know what kind of ball God can throw. He's going to toss you like a ball into a far country. I sure don't want that. Do you? But he, he's going to remove him. And he says, uh, there you shall die. There your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your master's house. So I will drive you out, look at this, of your office. And from your position, he will pull you down. You can no longer be steward. You can no longer be responsible for this assignment. You have gotten off track. Well, what's God going to do? Who's going to take it over? Look in verse 20. It shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him, look at this, with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. You see that? God's going to get his stuff done. It's just either going to be through you or through somebody else, and it's up to you. And then he says this, he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. He is going to come in and what used to be your job is now his assignment. And I'm going to put this responsibility and what he's going to have the keys to the house of David. And he is going to open the doors there. He is going to be doing the very things you used to do. And he says, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. He will become a glorious throne to his father's house. They will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the posterity, all vessels of small quantity from the cups to all the pitchers. And I'm going to go back into our text because this, it certainly relates to this. Jesus says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him uh, a new name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So just like what he did in Isaiah, right, this guy gets removed, Eliakim comes in, he's, got a, he's fastened like a peg into a wall. And anything you hang on that will be secure. And so he's in that house. He is in that assignment now. And man, everything that... That other guy had an opportunity to do that was forfeited is now a responsibility of somebody else's. Jesus has the application for us today and for that church. He who overcomes, he who will do all of God's will, he who will walk through the open door, God's calling you to walk through. He who does that, I will secure him. He will be the pillar. A pillar upholds some weight. It's a, res a res pillar has a great responsibility. As you're faithful to the responsibility you have here, there's a great responsibility coming in heaven. What is that going to be? I have no idea. But I can look at this text and say there is something. And what you do now, it does matter, even as a believer, for your eternity. Heaven is good. It is going to be very good. But apparently we come to texts like this and it won't be the same for everybody. Be faithful to what God has called you to do here. And I'm telling you, the open door he has for you even in heaven will be something of great significance. He'll write on your new name, and you'll be advertised as that overcomer. Revelation 4.1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. That door is open. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you things which must take place after this. This open door is open. And I'm telling you, a trumpet is going to blow one day. And we will be called into that open door. And everyone who walks through that open door is the one who walked through the open door of salvation today. And if you walk through that open door, I'm telling you this, 
What's coming before you is the very throne room of God, access to him and the assignment that he has for you. And I would just ask you today a very serious question. Have you walked through that open door? We're going to have our last song and time of worship, time of invitation. But this door, you know what? It's already been opened. You could not open the door of your own salvation. You couldn't do enough good works for it. But Jesus Christ, he went to the cross. He died for you on your behalf. He paid your sin debt in full so that you wouldn't have to. He opened the door and he has that key. And I'm telling you, he who is holy, he who is true, opened it up. And I would just ask you this, is God's spirit speaking to you today? Is he calling you to walk through that open door? If he is, go in. Because one day it'll shut and it'll never open. The door of church membership, I'll just invite you to this, is open for you today. If you don't have a church home, the door is open. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you say, look, well, we've walked through the open, I've walked through the open door of salvation, trusted him. Whether you've been baptized or not, we can make that happen for you. But if you don't have a, a church home, that door is wide open for you today. And if God would make it plain to you, this is it. This is your church I want you to walk through. Then please do that. Obey him and we'd be glad to help you walk through that door of church membership. All doors will shut. The door of salvation, the door to serve him. One day, it just comes to an end. And God brings in the new heaven, the new earth, and everything we had an opportunity to do now is over. But today, thank God, it's open. All you got to do is walk through it. Once you walk through that open door today, would you stand to your feet? I invite you to bow your heads and hearts with me. And has God's Spirit been speaking to you? He can do that in many different ways. I want to emphasize salvation. I really do believe there might be someone in here that just is not sure or hasn't done it. Don't let that door close on you. When we sing, won't you just come up here? You can even be discreet about it. We just come here and we just pray together. Right up here up front. And when we sing, I want you to be the first one down. You just let go of that torment that's been driving you nuts. Get rid of it and just come and talk to me. And it very well may be that you need to join our church and we would love for you to do that. You just get in line and we want to talk to you about that as well. It may be that, man, God has put a door open for you and it's been open and you've been too afraid to walk through it. You've been looking at your own resources. You got every excuse in the world why you can't do it. Today, would you tell him, yes, I'll go through that door and I'm going to trust you. With whatever God is calling you to do, he's holy, he's true, and he'll provide. Walk through that door. Take that first step and just show him that you put all your faith in him. Whatever God's spirit is speaking to you today, please respond. And as we sing, you, you come down. Lord, we love you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who has conquered everything that we could not. And we thank you that because of Jesus, we can walk through the doors that you put open before us. We thank you because of Jesus, they can even be open. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak and move in our hearts, help us to move forward in the center of your will. You speak, God, even in this time, even as we sing, we pray you would continue speaking into our hearts Replace that fear and all the what-ifs with the courage to trust you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, won't you come?